I now call to order the Society's 2,493rd meeting in what is now the 153rd year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW Science, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends to tonight's PSW meeting and the lecture by Phil DeShong. The Society is grateful to PSW Full Year Series sponsors, PSW member Mike Helton and Helton Associates LLC for their support. Thank you, Mike. Whoops. Great. Sorry about that. And to Larry Milstein and Robin Taylor for sponsoring tonight's lecture. Thank you, Larry Milstein and Robin Taylor. I'm pleased to note that the following new members have been admitted to the society. Gail Pettigrew Butler, an independent contractor interested in autonomous cars, nuclear energy, and AI, who learned a PSW science from a friend. William Blair, a researcher with Oracle Labs, interested in a wide variety of topics in science and mathematics, including physics, computation, and algorithmic complexity, and quantum computing, who learned a PSW science from IEEE member Harvey Newman. And tonight's speaker, Phil DeShong, who learned a PSW science from our invitation to him to speak here tonight, and whose interest will be cleared to you in part from tonight's proceedings. If you are interested in membership, you can access a membership application on the PSW website by clicking the Join button on the home page at the upper right-hand corner. And if you're here in the Powell Auditorium, you can access the application using the QR code on the tables at the back of the room. All who have a genuine interest in science are welcome to join. All members are entitled to a signed copy of Volume 1 of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, and if they so choose, to purchase and wear the ribbon of the society. If you are a new member and you have not received your signed copy of the bulletin, please come see me after the meeting. Recording Secretary Scott Matthews will now present the minutes of the 2,492nd meeting and the lecture by Tom Carr and Jim Trebes on directed energy weapons. Scott. Thank you, Larry. Good evening. On March 22nd, 2024, in the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., President Larry Milstein called the 2,492nd meeting of the Society to order at 8.08 p.m. Eastern Time. He began by welcoming attendees, thanking sponsors for their support, and announcing new members. Scott Matthews then read the minutes of the previous meeting, which included the lecture by Eric Klein, titled Survival of Civilizations After 1177 BCE. The minutes were approved as read. President Milstein introduced the, speaker for the, evening, the speakers for the evening, Thomas Carr of MITRE Corporation and James Trebes of the Department of Defense retired. Their lecture was titled The Emerging Directed Energy Weapons. Are they finally ready to provide real military capability? The two speakers alternated throughout the lecture. Carr began by indicating that the lecture would focus on laser-based weapons with some discussion of microwave weapons and no discussion of particle beam weapons. Carr presented an outline of the lecture including some history, physics, lethality, current U.S. systems, foreign systems, and military challenges. Trebes then discussed the physics of directed energy weapons, or DUES, describing the variety of ways the energy beam could damage or interfere with the target, including heating, creating fractures, spallation, shock,
shock waves, disruption in airflow, RF effects, and high electric fields. He described the, poten the potential advantages of directed energy weapons in terms of low cost per shot and, quote, deep magazines. He discussed his view of the roadmap for directed energy weapons starting with simple short wave systems, uh, short range systems capable of destroying UAVs, drones, and artillery, to mid range systems capable of destroying cruise missiles, to complex long range systems capable of defeating hypersonic and ballistic missiles. Carr then described some of the physics of dews. Given the focus on laser weapons, he presented a graph of the atmospheric transmission windows indicating which lasers operated in each of these windows. He discussed the early work in the field using chemical lasers, then the semiconductor and solid state lasers which began to appear in the 1970s and 80s, and subsequently the development of high powered fiber lasers which now represent the state of the art. He showed examples of diode pumped fiber lasers that are currently capable of generating and delivering hundreds of kilowatts of average power. He then mentioned the 22 specific directed energy weapon systems de deployed by the U.S. for defense against, quote, soft targets. Carr briefly described briefly discussed the physics of combining fiber lasers to create a more powerful beam, stating that these techniques will likely be used to create future weapons to defeat, quote, hard targets. He then presented some of the additional systems that need to be integrated with the laser source to create an effective weapon. These included the power source, cooling system, beam director, target tracking, fire control, and command and control systems. Trebes then discussed some of the physical limitations of dews. For laser-based systems, these include atmospheric turbulence, thermal blooming, and self-focusing. For high-powered microwave systems, the primary limitation is atmospheric electrical breakdown. He presented the concept of the, quote, kill chain, describing the flow of information from long-wave long-range radar, local radar, target tracking, to the command and control center, and then to the weapons fire control systems. Trebes then dis discussed kill assessments and the various types of kills. These included system kills, which result in, quote, flaming wreckage, and mission kills, which prevent mission completion. He noted that most laser weapon systems result in mission kills and not in systems kills. He then discussed ways in which high-powered microwave systems can get electromagnetic energy through the cracks and seams in a weapon in order to disrupt its electronics. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Carr then showed images of deployed directed energy weapon systems in the U.S. military, and he gave more details about each. These included the Navy ODIN, Optical Dazzling in inter Interdictor, the Army D. M. Shorad, Maneuvering Short range air defense, the Marines CLAWS, compact laser weapon system, and the Air Force HELWAS, high energy laser weapon system. He then showed images and gave details about future systems currently under development by the U.S. military. He also showed examples of directed energy weapons systems being deployed or developed in other countries. Both speakers then presented some of the difficulties in having the U.S. military adopt directed energy weapons. They discussed the fact that the Pentagon, and the warfighter in particular, do not trust these weapon systems because they are largely untested on the battlefield. They mentioned the bureaucratic hurdles associated with the, quote, integrated defense acquisition technology and logistics life cycle management system. They discuss the fact that the military has many different weapon systems that compete with dues. And finally, they discuss the fact that while the cost per shot was very low on the second shot, these systems required considerable capital investment. The lecture was followed by a short collegial debate. Carr argued that each branch of the military should create a new office to direct research into directed energy weapons. He argued that the research 
that this research should be moved from the traditional research laboratories, ARL, NRL, AFRL, to new labs that specialize in building weapon systems. Trebes argued that the creation of new agencies or offices was not necessary. He argued that such, quote, specialty organizations would only work if the organizations were given some form of congressional mandate, forcing them to spend money on directed energy weapons research. In the end, the two speakers agreed that they were, quote, not that far apart. The lecture was followed by a question and answer session. However, in the interest of time, the details of the Q&A session have been omitted from the minutes. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speakers, presented them with PSW rosettes, signed copies of the announcement of their talk, and signed copies of volume one of the PSW. PSW Bulletin. He then announced speakers for upcoming lectures, made a number of housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the Society. He adjourned the 2,492nd meeting of the Society at 10.29 p.m. Eastern Time. Temperature in Washington, D.C., 9.4 degrees Celsius. Weather, cloudy. Audience in the Powell Auditorium, 52. Viewers on the live stream, 53 for a total of 105 live viewers. Views of the video in the first two weeks, 946. Respectfully submitted, Scott Matthews, Recording Secretary. Thank you, Scott. Are there any comments or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion by a member to accept the minutes as read. I will entertain a second. Is that a second over there? All members in favor of adopting the minutes as read? All opposed? Hearing no opposition, the minutes are accepted as read and will be posted to the PSW Science website in due course. If anybody online has any comments or corrections, please submit them to corresponding sec at pswscience.org and they will be taken into consideration. And we now turn to tonight's lecture by Phil DeSong, DeSong. Phil is Professor Emeritus of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Maryland. He is also a consultant on integrity and compliance at UMD and a member of the ACS Committee on Ethics. He also is the CTO of Precision Nano Assemblies and previously he served as Chief Compliance Officer of the Research Division at UMD and held adjunct positions at Greenbaum Cancer Center, the Center for Nanomedicine, and the official Department of Bioengineering at UMD. In addition, he previously founded and served as president of SD Nanosciences. Phil's research interests center on the development of new synthetic methods, the total synthesis of biologically active substances, and the application of functionalized nanomaterials to diagnostics and as drug delivery agents. He is an author on more than 120 peer-reviewed publications, and he has mentored over 100 research students and postdoctoral fellows. He earned a BS in chemistry at UT Austin and a Doctor of Science in Chemistry at MIT, and he did postdoctoral work at MIT and ETH Zurich. As usual, all questions will be fielded in a Q&A session after the lecture. And without further ado, Phil, stage is yours. I have to put all my act together here. Wait a second. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. I'm thinking, right, Robin? Uh, we're back there, I'm on. Uh, we'll put this back up here. I'll need that. Where's it? This is demos. This is demo night. Chemists do demos. Okay, so um, first, after, uh, I hope the minutes don't reflect anywhere the way the last ones did on me. Is that, uh, I'll try not to have as many acronyms for you. All right. Um, and it was a great pleasure to 
to be invited here. It's actually an honor, and I, I, I must admit that uh, it's a bit intimidating having to talk to people. This is difficult because you usually talk to people who are sort of in your field, uh, and I can't be as technical as I would uh, I would be there. So I will um, present this in a, a, I won't say dumbed down version, but in a version which hopefully is easier for you to do. To understand, so uh, when Larry asked me to do this, to give us uh, talk about this, uh, the focus was actually on uh, COVID vaccines, so messenger RNA vaccines. So this will be largely about how does one formulate messenger RNA vaccines, and why are they this way? Okay, and I think you, I'll try and lead you through the whole process of why this is important. Okay. Um, so, okay, that's, that part you don't need to see. I do have a responsibility as an integrity officer in the university. I have to present this to you. Um, I've served as founder, president, chief technology officer of SD Nanosciences. We've closed this down now. Um, We've licensed some of the technology off to other people, and I'm the chief technology officer for Precision Nano Assembly with my colleagues, some of whom are in the audience here today. And uh, you'll see how that happens as we, I'll talk just briefly about this at the end. So this will be largely a literature talk, but there will be some other material at the end. Um, and I would like to acknowledge um, a group of people because what you're going to see tonight, especially towards the end, will be some work from our laboratory. And this has been a long time, 25 year effort on our part um, to work on vaccine formulation. Uh, particularly with Dan Stein, who's a microbiologist and is interested in infectious diseases, uh, particularly sexually transmitted infectious diseases. And Dan and I have worked together for 25 years on this project. Uh, I also work with Stephanie Vogel from the School of Medicine, who's an immunologist, and uh, Doug English, who's uh, now at Wichita State, who started us down this road. As You'll see some of our formulation technology based on this. And there's another group. The people on the left are all postdocs and graduate students in my lab who have uh, made important contributions. It's not all of the graduate students in my lab, but the ones who've made the most important contributions. The names in the middle, uh, I should point out uh, particularly Matt Hurley and David Watts, who've been instrumental in what you see tonight. Um, the, the names in the middle are uh, students and postdocs, and in one case, an undergraduate who sensitized to seeing how many glitches there are even in professional broadcasts. Like, you know, suddenly you get a screen that's fuzzy, where the color contrast goes, or the sound drops out for a couple of seconds. This doesn't count against my time, does it? No. Okay, I just wanted to make no, sure. No, what we do is we just turn the clock back. <laughs> yes, sir. So, quick question, sir. Yes. Starting uh, tonight, so with all the technical difficulties, are you going to be doing anything, anything special for uh, your, your lovely wife who's helping to navigate this thing? I'm just curious. I'd like to hear more about it. You're asking Yeah, me. I am. I, I do very special thing because otherwise I wouldn't have found my way here, okay? I mean, you must have been talking to her. She's telling stories about me again, you know. Are you asking no. him or me? You, asking oh, me. both of us. Yeah, he, he knows I'm, me from, from I'm, church. Okay. I, you are. Yeah, yeah. That's your problem. John, I do the maximum amount of special things for my wife every moment of the day. <laughs> yeah. We're I back would say up? the same thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, right, yeah. I think we're back up. We're, we're functional? Well, you're functional. Somebody's functional. Okay, go. Okay, okay so I, I, for the sake of the people on the web, um, I have to look here. I keep getting reminded. Uh, the people on the, people on the right legs at Maryland who um, have been involved in this work now. for many years and have been uh, instrumental in doing this. Okay. So what I'd like to do is give you a brief history of vaccine production. 
So the first vaccines uh, were actually, the first report of vaccine was smallpox vaccine. And this was in China in the beginning of the 17th century. And it had, the correlation was made between people who worked uh, around cattle and got cowpox that people who had been exposed to cowpox and gotten cowpox didn't get smallpox. But the first official vaccination for smallpox was, again, a cowpox vaccine by James Jenner in 1796. And so this is the first reported, this was actually a clinical trial, if you want to think of it that way, is that Jenner actually uh, took uh, cowpox and treated people and inoculated them against smallpox, and it worked. Uh, you, as you go a few years later, Pasteur reports the first rabies vaccine. He actually uh, did rabies, killed the rabies virus, got rabies uh, virus and killed it, and then vaccinated uh, actually a child at, the, at that point. So, I mean, if you look at, this is a clinical trial. You go to jail for this now, right? Um, there's a clinical trial. There's a clinical trial with a, with a child without informed consent, but we aren't going to talk about that. That's an integrity issue that we won't worry about. The first real vaccines that uh, made commercial, and I'm sorry that it's so small, uh, I didn't think about this, I should have made the type larger, I apologize, was the Salk and Sabin vaccines in, the, uh, 19, in uh, 1955. So these were the polio vaccines. Um, and uh, the difference between them was the salt vaccine was a dead virus, so you took polio virus and you killed it, and then you injected it into people and they were um, immunized against polio. Sabin vaccine was an attenuated virus, that is they had knocked out key genes that could cause the disease and then um, inoculated people. So I don't know, I don't really uh, know how I mean, I, as a kid, I'm probably old, as old as, or older than most of you. I remember taking the first polio vaccines. My mother remembers working in the great uh, polio epidemic of 1946 in hospital, and she worked in Houston, and the, she said they had iron lungs lined up as far as you could see with people in them. All right, so this was a, this was really a killer, and you don't see this anymore today. So we've almost eradicated polio. We're coming close. We've eradicated smallpox, but we have not quite gotten polio yet. And then in the early 60s and 70s, there's mumps, measles, and rubella vaccines. These were the first of the uh, again mixed vaccines against the killer diseases, especially in children. All right, so. Um, let's talk about how these were made. So prior to 1980, the, most vaccines were prepared using either dead or attenuated microorganisms. That is, you took the virus or bacterium, but we're going to talk mostly about viruses, took the virus, grew it in something, and killed it. All right? And then you turn around and inoculated people with that. Uh, after 1980... Right, and so the Salk and Sabin vaccines were were of that type. I also point out here pertussis. This is a, this is a bacterium. The pertussis vaccine. This is whooping cough. Uh, of the 1950. If you took that in 1950, which I actually was in, uh, immunized with that. You, once you were uh, treated twice with it, you never had to be immunized again. It was a lifetime of immunity. Okay. Um, so that, that was a, a dead organism. They killed the bacterium. After the 1980s, most vaccines are subunit vaccines. So the problem with, with dead organism vaccines in particular and attenuated organism vaccines, uh, you have a billion cells and you kill 99.99% uh, .99 of them, you still have live cells. And if you're injecting live polio, cells into somebody, there are going to be some people occasionally who get polio. And you still see this, even with attenuated ones today. Um, very small number of people get polio from the uh, Sabin uh, polio vaccine, but it's very useful. In 1980, uh, really most of the vaccines became what are known as subunit vaccines, and that is you took antigens, that is proteins that were expressed by these uh, organisms, you expressed them in some other 
organisms. So you transferred them to bacteria. This is a molecular biology revolution. You took the gene for the of, of protein, expressed it in some other organism, usually in yeast, right, which can't cause a disease, but sometimes in bacteria. You isolated those proteins, you uh, purified them, and then you formulated a vaccine and injected them into people. Right, and so they're called subunits vaccines. So after 1950, you got a pertussis vaccine, was a which was a subunit vaccine. Uh, there's the good news is that that you you can't give the disease from the subunit vaccine. The bad news is what you see with pertussis. It requires a booster, right? So you usually had to take this multiple times, and the. There's only about a 20-year immunity for the pertussis vaccine. So occasionally you still see this um, commercial on TV where you know the grandparents picking up the grandchild and it says, "Oh, you look like a wolf," and they, you know, you need to get a pertussis vaccine. This is usually for people who were vaccinated with that. And the problem is that you're only getting a couple of antigens. You're not getting a whole bunch of antigens. When you put the whole organism in there, you're getting, you're making antibodies to virtually everything in the world. Okay, so there's a reason reason for this. Now, uh, the influenza vaccine is a subunit vaccine. So it's done this way. The antigens are hemagglutinin, which binds to red blood cells. So this is why, how you confuse a, uh, the influenza virus against red blood cells and neuraminidase, which cleaves the uh, sugars off the edge. And um, that's how they get in. It's, it was grown in eggs. So you took influenza, you grew it in eggs, and then you isolated these uh, uh, antigens. Now we grow them in mammalian cells. So this is a really new technology, uh, 2019. Uh, virus strain are grown, uh, and then the proteins are isolated, purified, and formulated. So the typical influenza vaccine has four different strains. So it has four different hemagglutinins in it, uh, four or five, depending on how they do this. But they have to kind of guess what's going to happen this year. And they grow all of these various strains and mix them up. The new respiratory syntitial virus, which you see on TV, every ad, every other ad, if you're watching TV, is uh, Arexv, is a subunit vaccine for respiratory syntitial virus, and that is actually the antigen there is a protein called F glycoprotein, which is a cell surface protein on the outside of uh, RSV, and the. Uh, I just noticed yesterday that the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases has a new Ebola vaccine that has been, pure, uh, that's been acknowledged and uh, is being tested in a clinical trial. And this is against a protein called glycoprotein, which is on the surface. Um, it requires a prime boost, so you have to take two uh, of these because they use uh, two different variations of the EG protein to get to get this. So these are this is the way vaccines are, most vaccines are still made. Right, uh, the the vast majority of vaccines you see are still these subunit vaccines. It's very effective. Okay. Um, so how does it work? Why does it work? Why does the vaccine work? Well, I take something like a virus or a bacteria, and let's say I've killed a, a, a bacteria, influenza, I've got an antigen, but let's just say you get, uh, uh, we're going to give you a dead organism, in this case a virus. We inject it into you within an hour or so. You get, a, you get soreness associated with this. Uh, you get an inflammation. And usually your, your arm gets red. If you're, un, if you're unlucky, you really have bad inflammatory response, but most of the time not. This is the innate immune response. This just attacks foreign stuff. It doesn't care what it is. It doesn't know anything. It just attacks everything that gets in you that's foreign, right? This is what it's supposed to do. There is no specificity. It says, geez, this isn't supposed to be here. Get rid of it. And so you have white blood cells and oxygen, oxygenated uh, enzymes that just come in and just chew the thing up. Right? They break everything into pieces and they present those pieces to the adaptive immune response. Okay? So over here is the adaptive immune response, and once those pieces from the organism get transferred over, you start this elaborate process of B cells recognizing the antigen, activating T cells, killer T cells, cytokines, it's a huge difference uh, of responses. And what this makes is antibodies. And then you end up having high specificity antibodies for the antigen that you put in. Okay, so if I put a protein in, I end up getting antibodies to that protein. And those circulate in you for years, 
right? They're just, they're, they're not going to go away. And the body keeps producing them because you have an, an adaptive response. So this is very effective, right? This is the way you would like things to work, all right? Okay. So how does, it, how does a messenger RNA vaccine work? So this is actually, a, I'll explain in a second, this is a huge paradigm shift for people. So let's just look at how my antigen gets produced. So I have DNA, so my organism, my virus has DNA that um, is going to produce some protein which is going to become an antigen. That, pro, that uh, gets converted into uh, messenger RNA here, DNA, RNA, for those of you who took biology and back in, now they teach this, I think, to like sixth graders, you know. Uh, in my case, they waited till I was a junior in college, right? This shows you how, uh, and, and uh, from messenger RNA, we ultimately make proteins. Okay, so the proteins are what we've been using in our subunits, right? We put those proteins in the subunit. Okay, so in this case, the protein's the antigen. That's what's giving you the immune response. That's what the adaptive system is seeing. Right? So the paradigm shift is now you're using messenger RNA to make that protein. Okay? Messenger RNA, why does this work? Well, messenger RNA is easily grown in, under molecular biology conditions. So I can grow, I'm, I mean, high school kids make messenger RNA now, all right? You have an intern in your lab, you can make messenger RNA. It's not, it's not particularly difficult. Molecular biology revolution. No requirement to grow antigens. Growing proteins turns out to be a pain in the tush, okay? Making messenger RNA is much simpler. You don't have to isolate the proteins. If I take something and express a, a number of proteins, I've got to purify all the, the protein I want from the other 100 proteins that are in there. This is complicated, really complicated. And I don't have to formulate it into a vaccine. So if I have a protein, half the time that, that, that protein is wrapped up into a globular ball and what I do not want is for that shape to change because that's the natural shape of the protein. But when I formulate into a vaccine, this thing has a tendency to fall apart, open up, and then you get antibodies to the protein, but it's not to the, the right structure. It's not to the folded form, okay? This is a mess, all right? So making these subunit vaccines is complicated. So w wouldn't it be wonderful if you just took messenger RNA and put it in cell and let it make protein for you? It's the factory for you. That's what it does. It knows what it's supposed to do. This is a great idea, right? Everybody thought this was a great idea. And in fact, everybody told you it will not work, okay? I mean, it's a great idea. You look at it, it's very simple idea. Well, why is it that it won't work? Well, messenger RNA is rapidly destroyed. I take messenger RNA, I put it in a vaccine, I inject it into your arm. It's gone. Okay? Your body doesn't like foreign things. It doesn't like messenger RNA in you that it does, because you don't have messenger RNA floating around in your blood system, right? If you do, it's foreign. It comes from somebody else. It shouldn't be there. And the, the system is designed to destroy it. So it's rapidly degraded as soon as you, as you uh, inject it. It can only produce protein inside the cell. So you have to get the messenger RNA from, from your bloodstream into the cell for it to produce protein, okay? And cells don't want to take up messenger RNA because messenger RNA is in your bloodstream is foreign and it shouldn't be there. Okay? And so it's being destroyed. So there's no uptake mechanism. So this is a great idea, except it doesn't work. Right? This is really the, the secret here. Right? So, so a lot of people were aware of this. Right? And, and there are smart people out there who were concerned about this. And there are solutions. Right? For every problem, there's a solution. BioNTech and Moderna engineered messenger RNA variants that are resistant to degradation. That is, they made messenger RNA that didn't get rapidly degraded. And so they could inject that into you and it didn't go away as fast as other things did. All right? Encapsulation, 
protects messenger RNA from degradation. So we're good, this, is what this, this is what the whole talk's really about, is encapsulation. You remember this title? It's called encapsulation. It wasn't called messenger, you know, COVID mRNA. It's called encapsulation. I'm going to talk about encapsulation. So we, we, we candy coat. This is M&Ms, right? You know, you put a candy coat on the outside that protects it, right? The, you know, the chocolate doesn't melt in your hand, right? Because you have this candy coat on the outside. Messenger RNA doesn't get taken up into cells. Well, the encapsulation technology is such that it enhances uptake. Okay? There's smart people who do this encapsulation technology, and they just said, why don't we put something in there that allows us to get into cells quickly? Right? And then messenger RNA can only produce protein inside the cell. Once in the cell, messenger RNA has a long lifetime, and these people engineered their messenger RNA not only to avoid degradation, but to turn around and rapidly make protein. So they enhance the rate that protein gets produced by a hundredfold, decrease the rate that it gets degraded by a hundredfold, and now you can start thinking about doing things. And then they sugarcoated it to make it work. Okay? So, I mean, like I said, these are, these are smart people. Alright. So let's look at the, this. Now, for every single, for every problem there's a solution that's simple, neat, and wrong. Right? And these two people, who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine and, and uh, Physiology this year, were told for 30 years that messenger RNA vaccines would never work. Uh, uh, Katalin, the, the woman on, on the left, who uh, did a lot of this work with uh, Drew Wiseman's an immunologist. She was a, a molecular biologist. Um, if, I don't know how many of you have read this story. Um, she, she could never find a job, right? She was hired at, even at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Her work was deemed inappropriate. She couldn't get tenure. Uh, and fortunately, Wiseman took her own and said, look, I think you're doing interesting things, and let's, you can work in my lab, and all of that stuff. So she has, if you want, a, if you want an interesting evening, if somebody, is anybody here an author? Anybody like to do author about science? If you know somebody? You should have somebody write a book about her. She was a spy. Okay, she, I mean, look in Wikipedia. She, had, she was sent to this country on intelligence from Hungary. She was a spy. She admits it, okay? Um, this is a really, I mean, this is, an, this is a fascinating uh, story with these people. So, look, the, everybody said you couldn't do this. You, there's no way you could get all this done, and, sh and they did it. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what they did. So I'll try and, you know, like I said, it's not really dumbed down, but I'll... But there's a secondary structure here, uh, story, that I think is worthwhile. So how did they do this? Well, they have their... They made messenger RNA, so they have a, a DNA system that makes messenger RNA for them. It's very simple. When messenger RNA is made, uh, what you see is that there's always a tail on it back here at the end. So that's part of nature's way of doing this, controlling how many times it gets repeated, et cetera, et cetera. There's all this kind of molecular biology stuff that either I don't understand or I don't want to explain to you. <laughs> <clears throat> it's usually the first. I don't really understand all of this. So typically the tail is 250 nucleotides. It's just poly A. It's just adenine. It's just one after another, right? And this protects this. Uh, this it basically tells the cell how many times you're supposed to make antigen, right? How long's a tail? But what they found out was that if you have a tail that's only a hundred nucleotides, this doesn't get degraded very fast, right? So this is sort of tells everybody, slow down, you know, keep making antigen. We need you because you know. So they looked at all of these variations of tail lengths, and they figured out that this was right. I mean, this uh, this is hard work, right? Now, the other thing they did is they, so now they're interested in translating RNA into protein. That is this step, translational step. They started putting modified bases in the messenger RNA. So, you know, the genetic code, specific bases that get stuck in there, the four of them, I won't go into all this stuff. Either you don't care or, or you already know it. Um, 
And, and so they've started putting modified bases in there that still allow the messenger RNA to work, but it actually blocks degradation. So when, if you start to degrade the messenger RNA, these modified bases don't get processed properly, and it blocks the degradation, and you continue to produce protein. So again, this was very smart. They also... It, it also reduced the immunogenicity of this. That means when it's, they stick it in your arm and you get red in, in, in the beginning, the messenger RNA is being recognized as foreign, even though it's encapsulated in some cases, but this stopped a lot of that, right? Because if I inject messenger RNA in you, you're going to be a really unhappy person. Um, Codon optimization, so that is they put in specific bases that not only uh, protected against degradation, but actually made the translation faster. So as I told you, one of the things they saw was once they got these uh, unusual RNAs made, they were, they were 100 times less susceptible to degradation, and they were 100 times more capable of making protein. So they generated more antigen. Okay? Now, that's tw uh, that. That is about 150 man years worth of work on those two slides. Okay, that's 25 years, two people, right? Plus the people who work for them. So I'm, I've really simplified this for you. All right. Now, as I said, there are some other people because this is about encapsulation. We're going to talk encapsulation here because it, this, this, I'm just getting ready for the story here. You know, you're, this is the preamble, right? So. Here's Peter Cullis. So Peter Cullis is an 800-pound gorilla who did not win a Nobel Prize. And what Peter Cullis did was he developed the sugar coating. He developed the coating for these things. And again, we're talking about 20, 30 man years worth of Peter Cullis's time, and I cannot imagine how many students are involved in this, because I know of at least 100. Um, because Marco Cifellini is a synthetic chemist who I know who works with him, and he's had 100 people working on this over the years. So it's a long thing. And what they developed was they developed liposomes technology. Okay, and so we're going to talk about liposomes, right? Because that's that's what I do. Okay, I make I like these things. This is colloidal chemistry, right? This is what I do. So we're going to make this. We're going to make something that looks like this, right? And it's going to have a shell on the outside, and it's going to have a volume on the inside. And you're going to put messenger RNA in there, and then you're going to close this little door up, right? And then you're going to put this in, and this is going to float around your body and protect you until it gets absorbed by cells. And then this is going to fall apart and go away, and messenger RNA is going to be in the cell, and it's going to make antigen. Right? And as my wife and I would say, Bob's your uncle, right? It's going to be, you're going to look great, okay? All right. Uh, let's see, I have to do this. So now I have to teach you basic colloidal chemistry. All right, so you can look at this for a second, but every good chemist does demos. Now you know colloidal chemistry. I, I'm about to tell you things that you're going to go, whoa, this is like chemistry, whoa, I don't do chemistry. If we'd had a salad tonight, most of you would have done colloidal chemistry. Right? So what I have on the bottom is water. What I have on the top is fat. Right? Okay? And we're about to make colloidal particles. Now, you've made uh, a mixture of liposomes and micelles. And the reason it's opaque is because light's hitting it and it's scattering and it's opaque. Right? And if we sit around for a couple of minutes, this thing will go back and look like fat and water again. Right? So that's all, that's all this is saying. Right? If you want to get technical about it, which I like getting technical about it, this is what I do for a living, I take a, a fat, a lipid, it has a charged head, and it has this long tail, which is not charged. And when you shake those up, right, that tail doesn't want to be in water. The head doesn't mind being in water, but the tail doesn't want to be in water. So it avoids being in water, and the way it does this is they all stick to the inside, 
right? All those tails stick in where they want to be with each other. The heads are on the outside, so water's on the outside. All the tails are sticking to the inside. And this is called a micelle, right? It's one layer. That forms very fast, and it falls apart very fast. So it's falling apart, coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. You're going to see it as, as doing that as we talk. Every once in a while, these micelles, if you shake it up vigorously enough, these micelles will slowly convert over to a liposome. Now this is different than a micelle. This is actually, I have to go to this so you can see it. This is a classic lipid bilayer where all the fat tails are sticking in with each other. All the heads are on the outside. There's water on the top, water on the bottom. All right? If you take that film and you turn it around and you bend it back on itself, it will be a, a column. But what's the smallest three-dimensional shape in it, it, what's the smallest shape in three-dimensional space? A sphere. So this thing makes a sphere. Right? It breaks up into a sphere. It's a lipid bilayer. You can see here's the bilayer. Right? It's made up of the bilayer. And you can't quite see the little white dots on the inside because I put green in there so that you know it's a void. Okay? So it's basically, this outside would be the little white dots, all these little tails would be in here, and these would be white dots in there. Right? And there's my volume. There's water in here, there's lipid there, okay? And that slowly forms, and it's not particularly stable. It's not bad, okay? But it's not particularly stable. And what it would like to do is it would like to be a lipid bilayer. It would like to be a film. All right? So how do you know this? Okay? So you have grandkids and kids, right? You make lipids all the time. You make, uh, you make liposomes all the time. So those are liposomes. But they required you to make, first of all, you had to put in effort, right? And they're thermodynamically unstable. They don't like, the, they want to be a film. They don't want to be a sphere. Okay? So the question is, how are you going to get them to be a liposome and to survive long enough to deliver your messenger RNA? That's what took Peter Cullis 25 years to figure out. Okay? All right. So liposomes, they're stable, but they're not stable for very long. What is not very long? Two minutes? two hours, two days. Depending on what they're made of, they can be as long as maybe five or six days. All right? So Cullis goes in here, he takes a whole bunch of different lipids. Some of them have got some property. They're, they make their make they're sable in cells. Some of them are going to help you get into a cell. Some are going to do this. He makes a whole bunch of lipids. Right? And he puts them together, and he makes liposomes, and he captures a messenger RNA. When he does this, he did, I mean, it's, it's very simple. Uh, well, he didn't do it this way. But basically, you take, a, so you take all these lipids, and you, you shake it up with messenger RNA, and, a bottle, and then you look at it, right? And it's, you know, there it is. The, the lipids are made, if you do it right. So he figured out how to do it right. So this works really well. The problem is it makes, you know, we just did this. You saw how many you know, my bubbles were all the same size. I can't control the size of the bubble, right? Some of the bubbles are less stable than little bubbles, big bubbles. Well, who's the right size? So they had to have a way to make the right size bubble and uniform and all the time. So what they did was they went to NIST. NIST is our local friendly scientist out here in Gaithersburg, right? 
of which a couple are sitting in the audience here who I won't uh, burden you with. They gave them a microfluidic device, right? And this microfluidic device was designed to make bubbles of a specific size. And they could control the size of bubbles by controlling various parameters. They turn a few dials and a few knobs and widgets and stuff, and they could make bubbles of the right size. So this, this was uh, first, the microfluidic device was created and patented at NIST. Pfizer and Moderna used this device for the first batches of COVID vaccine. So they didn't know what the right size was in the beginning. So they could make all these different sizes and check them out. Subsequently, when they go to manufacture, as best I can tell from looking at the literature, they didn't, they didn't use the microfluidic devices, right, Mike? They didn't use these for the manufacturer in the end, as far as I know. Uh, we don't know. I mean, you know, they, for, they aren't telling you, but, but I don't think they use these. I mean, they're making 5,000 gallons at a time. The NIST patent uh, was ultimately, uh, whoops, was ultimately licensed by Precision Nano Assemblies. That's, that's us, okay? The inventor of this uh, device uh, retired from NIST and started a company uh, to, do, to work on uh, liposome technology for other things. So it's really, it's very interesting and I'll show you some of this uh, technology in just a second. All right. So this is how COVID vaccines made. So here's how the technology works. I'm not going to bore you with uh, all the stuff because I can't. I don't understand half of it. Uh, it's a unique, so it's, all these are little channels and they put water and various solvents in there. And what you end up having is this beautiful laminar flow system where you put in, we, we put in food dyes so you can see different colors. You can mix all of these various lipids and messenger RNA through this device and out the middle comes, uh, you put some in water, some in ethanol, and this lamp, this the system comes out and all these things mix at a, at a precise ratio and you can control all of this mixture. So you don't have to do what I did. Okay, you don't have to shake it up and pray that something good happens. Okay? And all these things work. And I mean, it really is lovely technology. And again, if you want to know more about it, we can talk about it afterwards. But it is terrific technology. Okay. Now, there are f currently there are 43 messenger RNA clinical trials underway just for COVID. This is other people. We have two vaccines, right? Oh, actually, we have more than that because we have different strains now. But there are 43 more clinical trials in process for for these. I mean, people think this is a serious problem. Three or phase uh, seven or phase three trials. So these are this is this is a big deal. Moderna actually has a, a messenger RNA vaccine for RSV, so this is going to take on the RexV, okay? And they use it by um, putting the messenger RNA in there. Uh, that's in a that's actually. Um, all the data is with the FDA that will probably get approved. And here's a number that's quite impressive. I mean, if you think about this, messenger RNA vaccines date from 2019. The first one ever commercialized was in 2019. And today there are 200, whoops, 200 clinical trials underway for other infectious disease, all based on messenger RNA vaccines. This is going to replace subunit vaccines. This is a paradigm shift, right? If you look at, especially for viral diseases, I think. Um, there's a 38 or clinical trials for cancer vaccines, right? Making cancer proteins, antigens that, that are used for cancer, and 18 or for other things. And that's just at the end of 2023. My understanding is there have been 40 more applications in the last two months. So, I think you're going to see this is going to change dramatically. So what could go wrong? Okay. All right. So how much, how much does a dose of uh, messenger RNA vaccine COVID cost? $100,000. Not 
So it's nothing at the moment. Well, it's actually it's a hundred dollars at the moment if you go to Walgreens because they've, it, and that's still subsidized. The cost is almost two hundred dollars a dose. Okay, why? Well, the cost of the lipids. So they use a, this elaborate set of lipids. They're expensive. They're really expensive. Okay? And there's a bunch of them. Um, the lipid charge turns out to be a problem. Uh, we could talk about that later. The toxicity of the lipid. Right? Some of the things are, uh, have a problem. Stability of the lipid nanoparticle. So I told you it has to survive, but you want it to fall apart at some point. So uh, the normal vaccine technology of the, the lipids for, um, the liposomes for Pfizer and Moderna fall apart pretty fast. I'll point that out in a second. So how fast do we get MRA out? The kinetics of the release, the manufacturing problem, and the cold chain. So if you, for those of us who do this for a living, what do you know about the, the Pfizer COVID vaccine? It is stored at minus 80 degrees, right? You have to, you have to prepare it and store it immediately. Pfizer has spent $500 million on minus 80 freezers. Okay? Transferring it around the country, minus 80. It gets to Walgreens, it's minus 80. They thaw it out. Okay, if you don't give it, use it within 12 hours, you pour it down the drain. It's gone. Because the liposome's gone. Your coating's gone. So we have about 12 hours to play here. All right? So the kinetics of the release is not very good. Right? The manufacturing is a nightmare. Right? The cold chain is a huge expense. Uh, and there's no intranasal or oral administration. Bummer. Okay, in the vernacular. All right, so let's address these problems. So we had, we've seen this before because we, we were told you can't solve this problem with messenger RNA. So there's, there are solutions. Can one approve on the encapsulation technology? So I think this is where a lot of the work is going right now. People are just trying to make encapsulation technology, something that will work for you. All right, so now I'm going to start talking about some things from my lab, right? And so you'll have to take this with a grain of salt because you remember who you're dealing with. Uh, in 1980, um, Eric Kaler reported that you could take two surfactants. These are soaps. These are two soaps. All right. They're also lipids, but they're they're soaps. They're common soaps. You can buy them. I mean, you know, uh, they're, they literally are soaps. Right. They're, they're what's in your dispenser out there when you squirt your hands and do this. They're soaps. Okay, you can take two soaps and you can mix them together, like I did there, and they will spontaneously form a vesicle, like this. And it will be 160 plus or minus 30 nanometers in diameter. And you say, so what does that mean? Well, that's the size that you need. That's the perfect size for delivery of messenger RNA. Because that's the, if they're little tiny ones, they get cleared by the kidneys. If they're big ones, they get cleared by the liver. 150 nanometers doesn't get cleared. So you now have a longer lifetime. What's particularly useful about these is that they're thermodynamically stable for years. So once I make them, they're all the same size, and they just sit there at room temperature, minding their own business. Okay? They're soaps. Right? So let's look at this again. This is kind of, oh, you, it's actually pretty big for you. It looks pretty tiny for me. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so what we can say, well, here's our problems over here. Our problems are the cost of the lipids. All right? Our costs are about a dollar a kilo for the lipids. Their costs are about $1,000 a kilo per lipid. They have six lipids. Okay. We form spontaneously. They have to use a device. We don't have to do that. We're stable for years at room temperature, right? We're highly efficient. pH is good. We can do this basically any pH we want to. Life is good, okay? We can actually heat these up to 85 degrees so we can pasteurize them. Uh, they're autoclavable and you can lyophilize them. So 
I mean, this looks pretty good. This addresses a lot of the problems. The cost of the lipids is down. Formation of the vesicle is down, right? Stability, we have some pretty good stability. Pasteurization, cold chain. We're looking good, right? So why isn't everybody investing money in us? Right? Why aren't we Peter Cullis? Peter Cullis' uh, two companies, by the way, have raised almost $500 million in lipid technology. Okay? Well, there are always issues, right? So again, we've got a problem. We've solved we've sort of a problem. So let's look at this. This is called self-assembly is your friend. So we do, these things know what they're supposed to do. You just pull them together, they know what they're supposed to do, right? I don't have to play with... You're self-assembled, right? This is self-assembled. So we can, we can take... Whoops. We can take pieces here. Whatever this is, we want... And we can capitulate it in there. So that can be messenger RNA. Right? So it looks pretty good. I mean, spontaneously and saline, life is good. Is it protected? Can we protect things with this capsule? Well, if we take our messenger RNA capsules, right? The little blue and red ones. See, I even got them color coordinated here. This 3D printers are wonderful, right? You know, this works. It's done by an undergraduate for us. Well, none of us could figure out how to do it. An undergraduate got it done in 10 minutes. We treat this with an enzyme that degrades RNA, 37 degrees for 24 minutes. We don't see anything happening. Right? 24 hours, sorry. 24 hours, we don't see any degradation. But if you don't have it encapsulated and you put it in there, that same amount of RNA would eat your, uh, would eat, uh, RNAs would eat RNA within an hour, it would all be gone. So the encapsulation is very effective. All right, you've made a really good sugar coat, a, a candy coating here, okay, for this. All right, so we're down on the cost of lipids. Charge on the lipids, we still have a problem, right? They have a problem, we have a problem. Stability, so you can actually make this too good, right? This is like a jawbreaker, you know? This is, you can make this too good if you aren't careful, right? Kinetics of release is a problem. We have all this other stuff down cold. So we're looking good compared to lipid nanoparticles. Surfactant vesicles look pretty good. Soap, ve soap bubbles. I, I make soap bubbles for a living. Okay. So uh, you can, you, I'm going to show you a couple of things that are interesting here because at this point we kind of changed the story. We changed the narrative just, just a bit for you. Okay? So these things are remarkably stable. Maybe too stable in some ways. I mean, unless you can figure out how to, you know, again, we're playing with this. They can actually be too stable. All right? Now, if you look at this under that context, what else do you know that looks like a surfactant vesicle? Cells. These are cells. These are effectively cells. Right? We've made cells. And we've made robust, stable cells. Hmm. Okay? So if you compare this to, to what you have over there, there's on the top is COVID with all of this little spike protein sitting out there. See all those little spike proteins? That's what everybody's going after is a spike protein, the messenger RNA. So if we take our uh, vesicle and we put all those little things on the outside, wouldn't we have an artificial virus? Couldn't we immunize you with that virus? So we decided we'd try that. We have artificial cells. Let's, let's, let's try this. So we have three environments on this surfactant vesicle. You can see them right here, right? We have the inside. It's water. It's lumen. We have our cell leaflet or our cell wall, if you want to call it that. That's, a hydro, that's hydrophobic. And we have the outside again, which is exposed to water. Right? So it's perfectly stable in water and blood. And put this in blood and it just sits around and thinks that it's this happy. All right. So we said, can we put something on the outside? So uh, if, this is freshman chemistry. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I wish it were more complicated than this, but I, actually it is, in a way, it's more complicated, but it's really freshman chemistry. So we made molecules which had heads on them which were hydrophobic, wanted to be in water, and tails which were 
uh, uh, sorry, hydrophilic and tails which are hydrophobic. They wanted to be in, in uh, fat. And we said, look, if we put those in there with our stuff, will they just automatically insert themselves in here? And the answer is they start like a, like a champ. They think they know what they're doing. They just go right in because they're, they're you know, we, did the, we played this game before, right? Where does the, where's the fat want to be? Where does the water want to be? Shake them up together. The fat goes into the leaflet, right, every time. So that tail embeds itself into the leaflet spontaneously it knows what it's supposed to do we don't have to do anything to it it just does it all right and what you end up with is something that has a whole bunch of things on the outside if that thing on the outside happens to be spike protein then you have a vaccine against covid all right excuse me but it's not protected we're not, we don't have any mRNA in it. We don't care about it. You know, the antigen that mRNA is making is a spike protein. Why not just put the spike Ah, because you could, you could do that. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. Ask me. Yeah, I'm not supposed to answer questions here. Well, I'll get back to you, okay? So this looks like this, and we can put, it turns out, we can put all, anything you want on there, basically. We can put all these very interesting biological molecules. We can put LPS, which, which is a, we can make it look like a human cell. We can put small proteins, large proteins. We can do all kinds of things will go in there. And so we've made a whole bunch of artificial cells. And we've made them that look kind of like whatever the pathogen that we're trying to immunize you against. So I thought this was pretty cool. And then we said to our microbiology friends, Dan Stein, we told him, Dan, why couldn't we just do this for any? Why couldn't we just take everything that's on the outside of a, of a bacterium and transfer it? You remember pertussis was much better when you had all that junk on there, most of which you don't know what it is, compared to just one or two proteins? Couldn't we do this? And all my microbiology friends, for like the people who talked to Weissman and Catalian, uh, they said, are you crazy? This will never work. So I gave it to an undergraduate, and she had it working in about two weeks. Right? So we were going to take everything that's on the outside of the cell, and we are just going to transfer it. So we took Neisseria gonorrhea. This will cause the disease gonorrhea. And we... This, strain F62 Delta, which means it gives you a very mild case of gonorrhea, okay? But nonetheless, we threw it in with our vesicles, which are nothing more than soaps. Remember, what is, how do soaps, are antibacterial, how do they work, right? They mess up membranes in your organism. And we transferred everything that's on the outside of Neisseria onto our vesicle. So we have about 40 proteins. You can see here, this is what this is. This is a gel. Shows a whole bunch of proteins, and we can prove that they're on the outside and what they are. These are all the interesting things like OPA and LOS. The OPA is the one that's responsible for the uh, Neisseria gonorrhea binding to the cells that it's going to ultimately cause the disease in. All right? So we have this. And if you inject this now in the animals, you get antibodies for Neisseria, gonorrhea. That's pretty cool. So we've now done this for coccidia, E. coli, francisella, Neisseria gonorrhea, Neisseria meningitidis, salmonella, right? Pseudomonas, which is a lung infection, very common in cystic fibrosis. It's almost lethal in cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, we have worked a little bit on Klebsiella with uh, Alan Cross at the medical school. Uh, Shigella and Vibrio are also possible. We haven't done any work on Shigella or Vibrio. We have plenty of work to do. And in all these cases, it looks like it works just fine, right? It's pretty general. So we're, we're relatively happy. Okay, um, and, and this one's really nice. So we've made a Francisella tularensis uh, vesicle. So we extracted Francisella tularensis. It's a biowarfare bacterium. Don't ask me, okay? I'm just, we're not allowed to work with it on the campus. I had to go to the medical school to do this with Stephanie Vogel and Fort Dietrich. But we've extracted tularensis 
and then we made a vaccine and we administered it to mice. And it works great intranasally. So we don't have to inject it into mice. We actually inject, uh, we turn them over and pour it down their nose. That's the way you get mice to do this, right? You put them to sleep, you roll them over on their back, you squirt it down their nose, and when they wake up, they go, and then you, and you've, you've basically immunized them. Okay? I have not done that. My students have done that. So um, I think what, what we were trying to say is that we think we're, we're on the... This, there are going to be lots of people working on surfactant encapsulation technologies. This is something that people should look at and take seriously. We're cheap. The cost of lipids is easy. Uh, stability. We know we can get things out. We've actually made vaccines that work. And now we've been able to do intranasal administration, which you can't do with liposomes. They're not stable enough. At least no one's been able to do it so far. All right? So I'm sure Peter and his people are working diligently on this. If you read his uh, website, he says he is. Um, and so I think this is where this is going. All right, and with that, uh, that's everything I wanted to tell you. I think this encapsulation technology is what you're going to see in the future, is that there are going to be lots and lots of people working on variations of liposomal work and other types of encapsulation that will get you uh, better um, conditions for, for doing uh, vaccination and targeted drug delivery. So you'll be able to do drug delivery this way. And with that, I would like to thank you. I appreciate Larry giving us an opportunity to talk about this. And I think it's okay, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. We have time for questions. Uh, everybody knows by now probably there's a procedure for questions. Keep your hand up long enough for somebody to come to you with a mic. The mic will have a colored windscreen and I will call on you by the color of your windscreen so that the person who is running the soundboard knows which mic to turn on and which mic to mute. We'll start with the blue microphone, but we will be sure to get a microphone to the man who has his hands up right there and is wearing a red uh, shirt. Uh, but blue microphone first, then red microphone, and hopefully by then you'll have your, your microphone. Yeah. Uh, now, please stand up, tell us your name, and if you're a member, and then ask a question. I'm uh, Michael Ball. I'm not a member. Um, I'm a guest. Uh, so you, you, you create this, basically, you, you mimic the cell of the virus, right? I mean, why, why doesn't that give the person the disease? So... Because there's nothing in it that does the rest of the thing. Because there's no transcription. You don't have any DNA or RNA from the virus that can that can then turn around and give all those enzymes that you need to to make the disease. There's nothing in there but water. The outside looks. What's on the outside of a cell or a bacterium is responsible for binding to the cell. What's on the inside is what actually causes the disease. We have no inside. And the stuff on the outside creates the immune response. That's what, creates, That's what the creates the immune response. So we just want, we want the innate system to break this apart and take all that stuff and take it over to B cells. Okay. okay? Thank you. Red microphone. Dorema. My name is Frederica Dorema. I'm a member. Uh, thank you very much for fascinating work. Um, I gather that what you do is uh, experimental, uh, trial and error. Have you, in a sense, employed any um, computational methods, modeling? Uh, and I'm not talking only molecular dynamics. Um, um, AI has proven that uh, it can be used, for example, for protein folding, design of new proteins, and so on. So what is, uh, because for example, when you construct this, and the question, how do you know that you may not construct something that's harmful? So, you know, you want to, in a sense, explore all the space, and modeling allows you to do yeah. that. So yeah. there's been quite a deal of modeling, uh, by Kaler and other people on how these things form. Mm -hmm. And actually I have uh, two undergraduates who are now looking at trying to use AI to predict if we start adding things to it, what would happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not, I'm not convinced that's going to go very far, but they, they are very enthusiastic, so leave them alone, right? Mm -hmm. let, them, let them try and do things. Um, in terms of what you pull off, 
what we have seen so far is, uh, and I'll explain to you all the details. I don't, I don't see to, to do it here. But we can, we can actually show that this is mild enough that it doesn't unfold any of these proteins that are on the outer surface. It actually just pulls off pieces of the outer surface and embeds it into this and carries them with them. So there's a way you can do this by making antibodies to the, the correct folded form and checking it against the folded and unfolded form and for the most part I wouldn't say exclusively, but for the most part, we see we don't unfold we don't unfold the surface antigens. If you get vigorous, you mess things up. So this has to be a very mild thing. So I have a former undergraduate who then left me and went to Stanford, where she was a star. Um, and I wish I had her back as a postdoc. Um, she did a wonderful job doing all of this. She was a molecular biologist in somebody else's lab and worked with us. So she was great. But she's, she's addressed some of those problems. We're a long way from having solved that problem, though. Yeah, we can continue the discussion. Uh, yeah, I'll offline, be glad to. Uh, but hopefully, there is no tyranny of distance. You can still work with your former students. Oh, yeah. So that's what, <laughs> so I hope between you know. Dan Stein and Stephanie Vogel, uh, I would be telling them what you told me to do, and, and now, you know, they'll be working on this. I can assure you. They're really Blue good. Blue microphone. Hello, my name's Noah Nelson. I'm a guest. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, my question is, it seems when you were explaining the different vaccine technologies that we went from uh, heat killed to subunit to mRNA and then almost back to soap killed, yeah. like you were, uh, like what you were describing. Well, so my question is, why is it um, that we, or what is it about the mRNA vaccine that made us kind of abandon the uh, proven subunit technology when making COVID-19 vaccines, especially in regards to being able to make these things widely available to the global south and uh, things like that. Right. So I think that this is that's a great question. So let me uh, sort of answer. I don't think you've you've or have abandoned subunit vaccines. I think what you're going to see is. Uh, is so easy to make messenger RNA vaccines that if they're effective, they're going to be easier to make and especially faster to make, okay, than what you can get with a subunit. So you spend years figuring out what's the antigen, right? So the beauty of, so everybody thinks that COVID happened fast. COVID vaccine happened fast, two years. <laughs> BioNTech's been, been looking at SARS vaccines and this technology for 20 years, okay? Funded by the Army because they were worried about SARS and MERS. These people have been working on this problem for a long time. And it became clear that once they had identified an antigen and they could get this to work, that this was going to be able to scale faster than a subunit vaccine. And I think the problem here is subunit. You can make spike. You could isolate it away from the other hundred proteins that are in the soup. Now you have to purify it. You have to show you it doesn't unfold while you purify it. You have to formulate it, and it can't unfold. It was clear that the messenger RNA vaccine was going to go much faster, right? But. A bunch of the vaccines you see right now that are coming in the clinical trials for COVID are in fact subunit vaccines. Well, they've just chosen uh, different parts of the spike protein. Yeah, it's worth noting also that there were about 70 different vaccine development programs that were tracked by, by WHO, and many of them were, were standard kilovirus, whole virus, subunit, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of why the mRNA vaccines ended up being the ones that uh, the government decided to spend billions on, but, but because there certainly they, were efforts. And they had already done it for, for SARS, for the, for, the, for, for the earlier SIRS and MERS that came out of, you know, the, they were afraid these were going to be pandemics earlier. They never became pandemics. But these people have been working on this technology for, for 20 years under government control, under go of government funding. So BioNTech's a small company. She's, obviously, these people know more about this than I do because the, um, they're shaking their head. BioNTech um, had almost $150 million worth of funding uh, by the time it actually uh, started producing things. So it was, only, it was very small. It was only 20 people, 
or 20, 25 people. But they've been at this for a long time. So here's what I think happened. They already knew, the federal government already knew that, I don't know this for a fact, but this is my bet. The federal government knew that this would work. The problem was nobody would fund a clinical trial, right? Clinical trials are two to three billion dollars, right? This was an unproven technology, and who's going to spend two billion dollars on an unproven technology? Remember, the first people who get away with this, now everybody and their mother's making these things, right? Okay? Not my But mother. somebody spent two billion dollars. Now people are willing to invest two billion dollars in this because they know it works. If you're the first, I mean, Nobody believed her when, they, when she said she could keep these things from being degraded. Nobody believed that. She was, I mean, she was ridiculed. She couldn't get her papers published. Nobody would fund her, right? I think, you know, once she proved it, everybody wants to be her neighbor, right? <laughs> I think there's a lot to that. Have you ever met her? No, I have not. I would love to meet her. <laughs> I think somebody ought to write about I mean, just read the Wick, just pull out your phone and read the Wikipedia thing. That's enough to get you. That's enough to make you just want to, you know, you go, wow, she is really interesting. She has done all kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> She's it's quite a story. It's a great story. And, and I think somebody should write about it. Somebody will. Yeah. Red microphone. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. Uh, what diseases are going to be best affected by this? Viral. Viruses are going to come first, I think, more than bacterial. Uh, uh, virus, you name a virus, and there's somebody making an mRNA vaccine of it now. Influenza virus, uh, that's going to be one. Um, a lot of the animal viruses, they're already, I mean, I mean, I have people in my university are working on a bunch of the animal virus ones. Avian influenza, they've already got this one. Uh, I mean, the people over in the vaccine center are already working on this. So I think, the, uh, you name a virus, there's an HIV mRNA one now. This, uh, there's a dozen of them. The, the ones that are going to make the most money are going to be cancer ones because they're going to obviously be uh, the ones that, you know, they always make more money because they're of this. But I think they're going to start with viruses. But you see there's, you know, the cancer ones are against proteins that are found in cancer cells. And so they're going to make antibodies against this. So I think you're going to see everything. Bacteria pose a bigger problem because uh, bacteria... Um, bacterial enzymes have to be glycosylated, and then see this doesn't messenger RNA doesn't make doesn't put sugars on them, and so this is a bigger problem that that people like Dan Stein and I have to worry about. Blue microphone. Uh, oh, he was yeah he wants one. Hey, no blue he, microphone. He had a, for, it's okay. Yeah, but he we'll wanted one him. for. Yeah, we'll sorry. Get to him. Blue microphone. Hi, I'm Lloyd Mitchell. I'm a member. I have a sort of a three-part question. The first is it doesn't seem that your soap bubbles require encapsulation. There's what there's nothing really encapsulated. It's on the surface too. Oh, yeah, I don't we don't encapsulate things. We can encapsulate things if you want it, but we don't feel obliged to do that. But we we're effectively a subunit vaccine. That last thing I showed you is a subunit vaccine. Right. Okay. So can this be used for mRNA or DNA yes. uh, gene therapy because the mRNA vaccines are really yeah, small interfering RNA mRNA you bet. And can you, with adding the epitopes, can you change the tropism? So they get, do they get absorbed by muscle or tumors or whatever? Can you target them? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've already reported. Uh, so one of the things we stuck on the outside were monoclonal antibodies. So we can now take it to that, and we can deliver three drugs simultaneously because we have three drugs on the inside. Great, thank you. You're welcome. I think we have a question from the web, and then we'll... Oh, we have a question from the web. And then we'll get the red microphone to somebody. Who, somebody raise their hand so she can give you the microphone. Okay, question One from, from the, the web. web first, then the red microphone. Sure. 
Um, you might have somewhat addressed this already, but I'm going to ask anyway just to be thorough. Um, so this question is from Joel, who is a member. Uh, he, uh, he says, the thinking is that second generation vaccines should focus on more than just the spike protein like Norvask. Can the same be done with mRNA vaccines? Yeah, you're just going to put in different mRNAs or you're just going to put in two or three different ones at the same time. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to see anything change. And this is, uh, so part of the problem is that Spike has a whole bunch of different regions and there are parts of it that change. It's, it's like influenza. So uh, let me just give you hemagglutinin. Hemagglutinin in the influenza vaccine has a corner on it as it folds and it's on the outside. And what you see in all the different, uh, they talk about H1N1, H1N5, all these things. It's this corner that's changing, it's hypervalent, and it, it, they get all kinds of things, and that's where all the strains come from. Spike is the same way. You're just looking at small changes on the spike. So, but they're gonna recognize other antigens. The problem is, right, okay, I don't do COVID, so I, I can't tell you the microbiology of COVID, but as far as I know, the only identified antigen from COVID right now is spike. If in the, in the companies, they probably know that there are other antigens out there that are worthy of being messenger RNA. Did you? So the beauty of this is, you know, if you know what the antigen is, you just, you just you go into the lab and synthesize the messenger for it. You don't have to grow it in anything. You, you, you give it to an undergraduate and give them the right chemicals and they're going to make, I mean, it's really, it's, trivial to make master. I've done it. Okay, I mean, I'm inept. I have graduate students who do this all the time. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, I mean, it's not trivial, but you, once you know how to do it, it's not that hard. Doing it large scale, doing it, um, I mean, it, you know, purifying it is, is, a, is a nightmare, but so is all the rest of this. Yeah, I think they're just going to see people are going to identify antigens and they're just going to start making the messenger. Thank you. Okay, You're red welcome. microphone. Yes. Please stand up, tell us your name. Hi, I had actually just answered my question. So uh, Brandy, I am a member. Um, I did Google her name, Ars Technica, New York Times. There seemed to be a lot of online articles about her. I will read later. Um, but that actually was a bit my question, especially with the cancer vaccines. I think it said there were 18. So how do we sort of keep up with those mutations? But I, I think you touched on yeah, that. Yeah, I, uh, I think this is what you're gonna, you. you're gonna see is that people are gonna uh, do this. The the hard ones right now, I mean, if you really want to do a cancer vaccine, what you're trying to do is you're trying to go after the sugars on the outside of tumor cells because they have unique sugars. And making antibodies to sugars is not going to work by messenger RNA. And that's not going to work. So if, I think you're going to see that. But if you identify an antigen with a tumor, that's, I mean, these people are making, you know, these people look at this and say, oh, I've got a tumor that's known to make a protein and we're going to do this. I don't speak for the pharma companies, but I bet you, be willing to bet you, they know all the antigens it's, that they want. It's been very hard to find a unique marker for cancer cells. Right. You end up with a lot of cross reactivity. And so you're not really targeting just a cancer cell. Yeah. You, it's that's a magic you, bullet monoclonal. The sugars are unique, really but the hard. proteins are rarely unique in cancer, right? But we'll see. Red, then blue. Red microphone. Maria Zemankova, member. Thank you for a fascinating talk. You're including welcome. Including your wonderful presentations. Uh, given the statistics you had shown, how many well, drugs or uh, vaccines there are under development for different infectious diseases? Which oh my one gosh. do you think we should be focusing on? And I'm going to prime my, my question. Childhood diabetes. It apparently happens when there was a bacterial infection in the child. Could it be a vaccine against diabetes? No, I think you're going to do the childhood diabetes. Okay, I, I don't do childhood diabetes. I can't. My bet is that what you're going to do is gene therapy. You're going to put in a small interfering RNA that turns the gene on or off. Or you're going to do CRISPR technology and go in and insert the gene and do that. Um, I don't see this as a vaccine. It's not like I can produce a protein to do this. Now, what, what you might be able to do is you may be able to put in insulin producing thing and get that to work. But I don't think that's a long-term solution for what you're doing. But 
I don't know. You're talking to somebody who's worse than a rank amateur. Okay. <laughs> I I don't I just don't know about that. But it, from what I, little I know, that's not the way you want to do that. Now, G, turning genes on and off, that's cool. Yeah. Right, sir. So we're going to do blue and then we'll do red. So go ahead and hold oh, the my mic name here. Is Timothy Thomas. Hold the mic. Yeah. That's my it. name is Timothy Thomas. I'm a member of the society. Uh, my question is very basic about RNA vaccines. As I understand you to say, the messenger RNA has to get in a cell and it makes the antigen that then gets expelled to the blood and makes the B cells. Which cells does it get into and where is it made? Ah, so that's really interesting because what the mRNA for COVID, where it goes, is actually into muscle cells. So they're injecting into your muscle right? And it gets into muscle cells and muscle cells start to produce uh, spike. And then it gets into the bloodstream and the bloodstream and then the system sees it. So my understanding, although again I'm, I, I don't do the biology side of this same pharmacology, I should ask Stephanie, but my understanding is it goes into muscle cells. If somebody's online and they can answer that more intelligently than I can, they're welcome to make a comment because I admit I don't, I can't answer that with pure authority. But my understanding is that it goes into the muscle cells. And that's the reason they give it to you intramuscularly. But it could go into any cell. If they inject it. So a lot of the tumor vaccines, uh, messenger RNA tumor vaccines, they inject it straight into the tumor. So they, you know, they open up and, and, and you know, right into the tumor, right? It takes seconds for the whole Can he have, a, give him the microphone back if he's going to talk. <laughs> I'm just saying, they inject it in my arm, it only takes a few seconds before it's every cell's getting exposed to it. Well, it, so if it were in the bloodstream, then it only takes about uh, 11 minutes to pass through your bloodstream cycle, right? Mm -hmm. But my understanding is it's absorbed, because of the, the lipid surface, it's absorbed rapidly into the neighboring cells where it's injected. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is that that's mostly muscle cells, and mm -hmm. they start to produce. But I'm, like I said, I don't. Yeah, well, I have done this for a living, so I can't promise you anything. Okay. All right, we've got the red microphone, Jared. Hold oh, yeah. it by your chest. Sure. I'm, my name is Jared McQueen. I am a member. So if this delivery system is cheap, it's easy, it can be done by inept people, as you said, do you have any concerns that other nation states or bad actors might use this to deliver something evil instead of good? And what are your concerns or implications with this falling into the wrong hands? Well, it's already could have fallen in the wrong hands. Kaler did this in 1980, so it's 40 years old, and there's five, 600 papers on basically versions of Kaler technology, not including the 40 or so from my lab, okay? Uh, I don't see that as a particular problem. I, we've spent our time actually working with the Army on vaccines against biowarfare agents, which is again, what, why we did Francis Tularensis. That's much more dangerous. Francis Tularensis is more dangerous than anthrax. Okay? Uh, and the, certainly making a vaccine against Tularensis is, people are very concerned about that. So we made a vaccine against Tularensis. So I, I could plug myself, uh, let me plug myself because this is uh, this, uh, ourselves, not myself. We made a vaccine against gonorrhea it's very effective, and it'll never get tested because there's no animal who gets gonorrhea other than humans, so we can't run a clinical trial. Not in the United States. How big is the um, lumen on these things? Could it accommodate a bacteria? Can we put it on the inside? Yeah. No. But you can certainly you can put a, you can put a whole virus particle inside one of these if you want to. Um, we can put plasmids in there, which we don't want to do. But you can put plasmids in there. Uh, well, they're small. Yeah, they're relatively small. We can put phages in there. Awesome. They're bigger, but they're bigger. Somebody else has a question: blue or red? Blue. She's blue. Blue, 
microphone. Hello, my name is Grace Blackwell. I'm a guest here. A um, question that I had was, can you speak a little bit more on the toxicity of lipids and what is being done to solve for this? Okay, for our stuff, the toxicity is about the same as a liposome. Okay, for our materials. So one of the things that saves us, okay, as I talked about how robust it is, if I were to take one of the components, only one of the two components, and inject it into you because it never forms a liposome, it only forms a micelle, it would actually be extremely toxic. But because they form these vesicles and these are thermodynamically stable, the toxicity is about the same as a liposome. So if we take uh, this, we, we take one of these and we put it into you and chest of toxicity against liposomes were virtually identical. Okay, so that doesn't mean we aren't toxic. That just means we're about as toxic as everybody else. Um, they are, we are, we are toxic. And so the question is how do you cut the toxicity down? And we've now figured out how to reduce it maybe sixfold. And there are probably other strategies for reducing it. But, we're, you know, we can do the same thing that Cullis does. He starts putting things in there that reduces the toxicity. That also reduces the stability a little bit. We don't really, we don't think we have, we have a lot more room to play than he has. Right? But there is no guarantee that any of this is going to work. As a, as a, but we think the better chance is, is not to carry mRNA, but to carry other things. Any other questions? Uh, you're pointing, is that a blue mic? He's back again. God, you're glutton for punishment, aren't you? I have a follow-up question for, for the, about the COVID um, muscle-targeted liposomes. So how long is the um, spike protein made by the muscle cells, and is there any cell death because of the, when the immune system wakes up, do they get attacked by the immune system? No, they get, ex my understanding is there's not much toxicity associated with the spike protein. It's, uh, you don't generate that spike protein, so it's a, as soon as it gets expelled from the cell, it's, uh, it's recognized as foreign and the whole, uh, ad you know, the adaptive immune response, the innate and adaptive immune response start doing their jobs, cutting things up and presenting them to the adaptive. So, but it does not appear to be toxic, but again, there's some pharmacology that you're asking a question that I would not feel comfortable giving you a definitive answer. Thank you. But I, my understanding is there's not a problem. Oops. Blue microphone. Hi, Brett Magram. I'm a member. Um, I remember reading somewhere, and I hope this is true, or I, I, maybe I can't remember if, I rem if it's true or not, but I remember reading that with the COVID vaccines, women reported that they had more adverse reactions than men to the, I guess, to the lipids or something. I was just hoping you could touch on if that fact is true, why would that occur more commonly in women than in men? I have, th so I can't answer that question. I can tell you that it does look like that women are more susceptible to inflammatory responses to it, which is the innate response. Okay? Uh, so Stephanie Vogel, my collaborator, took the first COVID vaccine and was unable to walk for two weeks because of knee and hip problems with inflammatory response. So I do, uh, apparently those, and those go away, right, shortly, but I don't think they want you doing this a second time, so she's never taken a second one. Uh, I don't, uh, but you're asking me a pharmacology question that I can't answer. I, don't, I just don't know. It does, my understanding, I've read the same thing you've read, okay? It looks like women have this inflammatory response, which is the innate response, okay? Are more susceptible to this, but I don't know why. Any other questions? Okay, hearing no other questions, uh, thank our speaker for this talk. Before you go, I have, oh. we have a few gifts. Now what? Uh, we have a, a rosette for you, which on its side has uh, three lines that echo the symbol for inductance, which was discovered and studied by our founder, Joseph Henry. We have a framed copy of the announcement of your talk. 
and we have a signed copy of volume one of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society explaining why the society was founded, who founded it, and it has a very nice exposition on the nature of discourse in a scientific society, which you probably will find interesting. You can pass on to your students who probably don't believe in that sort of discourse at this point. No, I have, but. I have a gemstone team. So I have six undergraduates working for me and they've devised their own project and they spend four years doing a research project. And they've decided to do uh, antibody drug conjugates using this technology. They, des they devised the whole project and did this where they plan to put use this as a drug delivery system. So I'm, I'm sort of mentoring them, but as I point out to them, this is your project. You figure out how to make this stupid thing work. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I never did get back to that one. Before we go, we have a few closing announcements. The next speaker will be at the 2,494th meeting on April 19th. It'll be Richard Pyle of the Bishop Museum in Hawaii will be speaking on deep ocean corals and no doubt will tell us about the innovative equipment and procedures he's developed that have allowed him and others to dive to very deep depths and to spend time there long enough to study the corals at those depths and find uh, a wide variety of new living things there. This um, meeting is going to be uh, co-participated in by the Washington Academy of Sciences and we're hoping to see quite a few people from the Washington Academy so BSW members please show up and, uh, and enjoy the repartee with these people who have not generally speaking, participated in PSW meetings. They're also going to subsidize some of our refreshments, so we should have even more refreshments than usual. <laughs> okay, the speaker after that will be uh, David Spurgel. He is a physicist and the current president of the Simons Foundation, and he chaired the panel on UAPs and likely will be speaking on unidentified aerial phenomena. It's interesting to note that aerial seems to mean underwater as well as in the air and in space. It seemed like a kind of novel use of the term, but that's why they changed it from whatever it was before. Was it unidentified flying phenomena or something? I don't know. Anyway, it should be a fun talk. Uh, the 2400 and 96th meeting will be the annual Joseph Henry dinner. The lecture will be on May 17th. The speaker will be Brent Seals of the University of Kentucky and he'll be speaking about recent success reading ancient scrolls. Now these scrolls are burnt. They're almost charcoal. They're completely impossible to manipulate manually. And he's developed a x-ray tomographic method that allowed uh, the reading of some of the, one of the scrolls, um, which involved a contest um, in, that was won by, by three students flung out over the world who used artificial intelligence programs to decipher the text. But the implication of it is that we might be able to recover text from a, a trove of ancient Greek manuscripts and if you know anything about um, the classics of Greek and Latin classics, you know that a lot of what we know about philosophers is secondhand. We know about so-and-so because so-and-so wrote something that tells us about so-and-so, but we don't have the original writings. And it may be that some of these scrolls um, have, have the original writings. And there are also many, many more scrolls, they think, in Pompeii than the ones that have been so far recovered. So this could be quite a revel an, an eye-opening revelation um, of ancient Greek literature and philosophy, which some of us still think is really important. The 2,497th meeting will be on May 31st. The speaker will be Masahur Nasaharu Subakora and he'll discuss the health effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster and the efforts to deal with it. 
And the 2498th meeting will be on June 14th. The speaker will be former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin, who is currently co-CEO of Logic. And he will be telling us about his idea about how we can get U.S. feet back on the moon really quickly. An idea that's been thoroughly panned by Elon Musk. So I'm hoping we'll get Elon Musk here to rebut what he has to say. And the last meeting of the spring will be the 2499th meeting on June 28th. The speaker will be Ben Schneiderman, and he will be speaking on human-centered AI, ensuring human control while increasing automation. A sneak preview of what's in store for the fall. We'll be having a talk on the facility for rare isotope beams, which will include discussion of the structure of nuclei and magic number violation. But for people who want some fun, we're going to have a talk on constructed languages, particularly Klingon, by the person, by the person who made up Klingon. We'll post further commitments to the website as soon as they are available, so please check the PSW website frequently for updates to the schedule. And finally, we note this is just a few days before the total solar eclipse that will be seen in a swathe of locations in the U.S., among other places. And for those of you traveling to see it in full, I hope that the skies will be clear we are heading to Cleveland, so we're hoping Cleveland will be clear. Hmm? All right. Let's thank our volunteers for helping with tonight's program. Please, please return your name badges, $2 each, to the little basket in the back. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the 2,493rd meeting to the social hour. Second. All members in favor? Aye. All opposed? Meeting is adjourned.